Should we start? Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, I'm doing that that thing where I've got a, a a slide up, and I'm I feel like I'm talking to myself, but I know you're all there. So, um, uh, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, I I wonder if I could just um, before we start do a um, I'm going to stop sharing a second and do a little experiment. Um, can you see if, if you've received a, a copy of the report, either the either in digital format or in print format? Could you use the raise hand function just to just so I can get an idea who's who's already seen it? In fact, I don't know how to do that anymore. Um, Totti's managed to work out how to use the raise hand. I hang on. I I think it's in the um, oh you can you can use a in the reactions tab. You can click on something there to show you've. Um, okay, so it's a, so it's a mixture. It's just I just wanted to get a sort of rough idea. So some people have seen it and some haven't. So um, I'm, I was just sort of wondering how much detail to go into various bits and pieces um, so that that's given me a, a good idea it's great to see so many of you here I know we've got um, we've got um, people from so becoming a bit of a global room full I think we've got Mark from Mark Johnson can you can you give us a wave from it must be like four o'clock in the morning for you yeah <laughs> Um, and has Elaine joined us? Is, is Elaine here? Um, not yet. Not, not yet. Um, so well, yeah, anyway, thanks for making the effort to get up so early, Mark, to, uh, to join us. Really appreciate that. And uh, be, uh, be nice to get uh, your point of view from, from the other side of the Atlantic, perhaps a bit later on. Um, right, I'm going to go back to screen sharing. Um, and hopefully go to the next slide. So so what I want, the way we wanted to do this today is um, a little bit of an introduction from me. I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we did the report and how we put it together. Um, and then really it's, uh, I, I don't want to talk too, too much. I want everyone else to do the talking. So um, we picked out three, uh, three areas from the report that we thought were quite interesting. Um, there, there's a lot more in the report than just these three things we've picked up on, but for, for today we thought we'd look at these three. Um, so I've, I'll share some of the stats that we picked up in these three areas, and uh, we'll, we'll have a we'll have a talk about some of those. And um, really pleased that um, Carrie Ann Payne is is going to join us as a sort of guest and a additional speaker. We're going to be asking her some questions a bit later on, and then of course from the outdoor swimmer team, we've got Ella and and Jonathan. So um, I'm just going to kick off with um, a very brief introduction. So so this this is the report. This is the, the full report. I think m mostly we've been sending out the highlights report, but we have got a, a full report available. And if after reading the highlights, um, people want to get hold of this. And if you can get in contact with the, Yvonne after, then we'll, we can arrange to get a, a copy to you. Um, we decided to do this report uh, I think we, we were looking at a couple of things obviously what happened last year with with the coronavirus pandemic and how that um, impacted swimmers and the businesses that serve swimmers so uh, that that was the main sort of theme about the, the report but also, also we, we've been asking more general questions about why do people swim uh, what are, what benefits do they get from swimming outside and um, so that was that was what we were we were doing, and the the methodology we used. We we ran a, a big survey in October and November last year. Um, with we had about two and a half thousand responses to that, asking people about their attitudes to outdoor swimming. Uh, so uh, have we got anyone from Swim England on the on the call? Because they were uh, they very kindly um, helped us sh get that survey out. So. Uh, what I what I really appreciated about that it wasn't just our readers we've reached out to to a wider audience so hopefully that 
survey represents not just people that read outdoor swimmer, but uh, but people who are involved in outdoor swimming more more generally. Uh, so we're really pleased with the with the results from that survey, and I did a lot of digging around in the results there. Um, and then we also spoke to to a lot of people who work or are involved in um, outdoor swimming in various ways and picked up their their views, simulated all of that. We did some desk research as well, looking trying to sort of uh, triangulate onto numbers from different sources to try to get a, a, a good fix on on what's happening in in various areas. And so that's all gone together in, in the report. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through all of that, but I do want to just share a couple of quick things before we go into the into the discussion. Uh, so I'm going to just go back to share screens again. Um, so one of the one of the questions we're, we're frequently asked is how big is outdoor swimming and how much is it growing? Um, the source we the, the sort of go to source for something like that would be Sport England and their active live survey. Um, but that hasn't been updated. Um, well, it hadn't been. I don't, I don't know if it's been updated since we did the report, but I, when, when we were putting this together, it hadn't been updated since 2019 in terms of outdoor swimming. So we couldn't use that as a source. So we, we looked at a couple of other things. And one of them was the amount of searches on Google for outdoor swimming, wild swimming, um, open water swimming. Um, I'd love to be in a room now. So I had a pointer and so I could point it out, but you just have to see it on the screen. But you can see those are the, the three peaks for the last three summers. And obviously last year, not only was the, the peak a lot higher, the um, if, if you look at where it kicked off, it started in April when first lockdown started. Um, so not only was, is the peak higher, the, the, the breadth of the peak is much broader. So that really represented a big increase. We think about, well, between one and a half and three times the number of people searching for, for things to do with outdoor swimming in, in one way or the other. So that one, one of the very obvious effects, I mean, you know, anecdotally, people were telling us, oh, there's, there's swimmers everywhere. Um, we know once venues were allowed to reopen, they were they were very busy as well. And, and I think we've we've got a couple of people who are involved in venues who might be able to corroborate that for us a, a bit later. Um, but that was uh, just trying to put some numbers on on what um, what we were seeing and hearing. Uh, so that that was quite interesting. And then I don't know if this made it into the final report in the end, but we asked people. Um, so it was a smaller segment of the report of the of the survey data. People who started swimming last year and why they started, um, and you can really see the effect of the of the pandemic on that. If you look at the bottom three bullet points on that, um, they're all referencing the the pandemic in in one way or the other. So. Um, 18.6 for their mental health and well-being while pandemic res restrictions were in place, 23% because their pool was closed and they were desperate to swim any way they could. Um, and 30% as a sort of more general had been thinking about it. Um, and then last year that, that gave them a, the push to, um, to, to uh, sorry, I'm just going to let Dave Candler in um, to go ahead and do it. So that, that was just um, a couple of things from the report. Um, then, okay, so then mo moving on from that and, then, and where I wanted to really start the discussion and hopefully get um, a few other people involved so it's not just me talking is um, one of the things that we, we noticed, we've been doing surveys of, of our readers for the last four or five years. Um, the response rate from, from women this time was 65% uh, compared with 50% in 2017 um, so that that was quite a dramatic change and I think that's um, that's probably reflected uh, talking to to people who were involved in venues uh, we obviously didn't have any events so we couldn't see whether that effect was reflected in events last year but I think at venues that is something that that people was were, were seeing um, and not not only is it that more women appear to be swimming outdoors than men it's that the women who do swim outdoors do so more often than men and that's that's both in in summer and winter and um, 
so I thought it would be quite interesting. We've got uh, Carrie Ann, are you, are you somewhere on here? Yep, I'm here. Oh, hi, Carrie Ann. Um, Carrie Ann was one of the people I, I spoke to when I was putting the report together. And um, with her straight line swimming, she's been um, coaching or, or is that the right? Do you coach new coaches or do you tutor new coaches? I don't, I don't know what the right verb is. But you've been yeah, quite qualifying a lot of new coaches. And I think one of the, the trends you have seen as well is um, that increase in, in female participation. So it'll be quite, quite interesting to hear from you. You know, you've probably been speaking to a lot of these people you've been qualifying and whether you had any thoughts on, you know, whether that what we're what we've seen in the numbers, is that what you've seen out in the real world? And whether you had any. Yeah, absolutely. On, on yeah, absolutely. So last so last year, 2020, so from April to October um, was, I guess, my season for qualifying coaches and that so last year I qualified, um, well, we put 118 people through the qualification and um, eight of them haven't done it yet just because of things that happened last year. Um, but of that 118, 82 were women, 34 were men. So, you know, there's still a lot of men wanting to become open water coaches, but I'm definitely seeing a massive number of those. So 82, uh, I wish I'd had time to figure out the percentage of that, but I'm not particularly good at maths. My spreadsheet says 82, 82 women. I was just going through the 2021, um, through the winter ones. I haven't quite managed to get those numbers and I'll, I'll write the numbers up in the chat in a second. Um, but essentially what, we're, what I've seen certainly over the last three years since I started doing this, that there's been a huge increase in the last two years of women wanting to become open water coaches. And I'd say, eight out of 10 of those women are doing it because they want to pass their passion for open water swimming on. Um, and the reason, the main reason for them is, is not to coach um, elite athletes or to coach triathlon specifically. Um, I always encourage them to step into that world as well, but most of them are looking to encourage swimmers to get in. So people that are either afraid of open water or wanting to just kind of learn how to, to get into open water swimming is I'd, I'd say a, a, one of the reasons why a lot of women are coming to me, maybe it's just me specifically, but coming to get the qualification, to get the confidence, to get everything that they need in order to take people into the open water, but more from the participation side of it than the competition side of things. Um, which I found quite quite interesting. And I'd say most of the men that have coached have probably gone on or want to, to go on to, to coach more of the triathlon uh, mm -hmm. type of open water swimmers taking on events, that kind of stuff. So it's, yeah. been, it's been really interesting, but definitely a huge rise in, in women, more so over the last two years. Yeah, I think those, um, in, the, in the full report, we, we looked at some of the differences between what men and women are looking for in open water swimming and I think that I mean it's not it's not huge um you know there's a, there's a big overlap but there is that distinction that, that, that there, there was a sort of higher percentage of men who were in open water swimming for the competition and the challenge compared with women and women were health and well-being and um sort of general connection with nature being outside all of that came through quite strongly um, one thing I forgot to say at the beginning, um, although I had got it in my notes, was if um, if you want to get involved, if you want to ask questions either of me or of anybody else or make a point, um, if you could use the chat function, Jonathan is hopefully monitoring that. I don't know if anyone's, I, I can't see the chat right now, but Jonathan, if um, Jonathan is, is there and monitoring that. So if you've got anything, you you know, if you want to jump in with anything, um, please, please use that and um, and we'd, we'd try and bring you in. Um, well, uh, as no one has yet, the other person I wanted to bring in on, on this topic in particular was Ella, who's a contributing editor at um, Outdoor Summer, and she also runs her dip advisor business, uh, which where she's been taking, uh, through dip advisor, she introduces people or takes people on, on swims. Um, and I think you've also seen that that, um, uh, within your dip advisor work the the high percentage of women that are coming through is that uh, is that something you'd you'd say was uh, a feature 
Yeah, hugely. I mean, I actually did some maths uh, last night and 94% of my customers in 2020 were women, which is significant, really, because I offer all sorts of uh, swims, long distance, short distance. Um, and I think, I mean, part of it is, you know, a lot of women come to me because um, they are self-conscious or worried. And I guess I have a, a reputation of being quite sort of open-minded to all sorts of abilities and body shapes, etc. So I know an awful lot of women come to Dip Advisor because they feel a bit worried initially. Um, but I think there's some other factors. I think, you know, I'm not saying men aren't social creatures, they absolutely are, but we do know that women uh, traditionally are more sociable. Um, and I definitely have seen, particularly in swimming groups that I swim with, um, an increase in women because it is a chance to socialise um, and meet like-minded people. Um, and I think the report has demonstrated that an awful lot of men um, swim because they enjoy swimming, just because they like it as a sport, as a form of exercise. Um, but also they use it as a way to challenge themselves and push themselves into events, which is often not the way women come to the sport. They do. Um, and they might then go on to do it. But I think um, definitely from even traveling the country for the magazine, I find that an awful lot of groups formed because one person or woman wanted to start a group and then asked a friend who asked a friend who asked a friend. So I think there's a definite social element there. Um, and also that um, it doesn't take very much to go for a swim. You don't, you know, to go running, it's quite a big task, isn't it? Um, it, it naturally going for a run with someone when you're particularly unfit or not quite in shape is quite hard but going for a little swim with someone is is actually a lot easier so I think it's a lot more accessible. Yeah and there's, there's a question from um, Katia on the um, on the chat about uh, I guess it's for Carrie Ann about whether she sees that women are taking up the coaching qualification to actually co coach people uh, as a business or whether they're doing it uh, just to coach their friends. So it's more for social things to do that as well. Absolutely, as a business, um, that is a huge part of what we we spend a lot of our time talking about how to kind of market businesses and things. And um, I guess originally at the start, a lot of people have an idea of something that they want to do. But what I'm starting to see now is, you know, it, people emailing me with logos and ideas and Facebook pages popping up and business pages popping up. So it absolutely is people looking to create it's not always the main business i guess the aim is that it will eventually become their their full source of income but it is definitely there's only a, a handful of all those people that i would say that are doing it just to be confident taking friends out um carry on can i can i just add something there i think when when we spoke you mentioned that some of the people that have come through your um your courses are people who um who are running sort of outdoor businesses with a, with a number of different strands. There might be some sort of yoga, there might be some paddle boarding. And um, one of the things they've seen is the, the increase in outdoor swimming. And so they've wanted to add the outdoor swimming qualification to that sort of portfolio of things they, they offer. Is, is, that, is that a small number or is that quite a big number of, the, of people coming through? I'm certainly seeing more of that now. I guess it's uh, what we're starting to see are um, venues as well, venues coming uh, and asking to put some of their lifeguards or people that would be doing some coaching uh, through the qualification. So there's like a venue side to it. There's people that already run either, as you say, businesses where they're doing paddleboarding and yoga and, and outdoorsy exercises. Um, I've definitely seen a lot more of that, but I'd still say the huge majority um are are mainly just looking to do open water coaching as um as an offering or as a as a business that they they're doing solely as that but there are definitely there's definitely a rise in the combination so it's even some some of the people own um like barns and holiday cottages and things like that and they wanted to be able to offer a guided swim if somebody or if a group were coming to stay there so it's definitely a lot of people are coming to it um, from many different angles, uh, which is great. Jonathan, is there anything else um, coming through on the, the chat that you wanted to pick up on now? Or should we? Uh, no, that's it. That's it for now. I was just going to add to... another element also. I think some, some of the things I've, um, some of the women and people I've spoken to um, over the last couple of years, actually, I think 
we can't hide from the fact that there's an awful lot of um, uh, a certain age demographic here as well. So although there are an awful lot of younger people swimming and we want to encourage that more, there is a big mass of people sort of in the middle age bracket. Um, and a lot of those women tend to be maybe uh, rejoining the workforce, as it were, or coming back to their career and they're recreating their careers. So what Kerry ann says about people wanting to develop their businesses in swimming isn't at all surprising. But I think also for a long time, um, swimming was seen as kind of dirty and outdoors uh, in rivers and stuff and unclean and unhealthy, you know, and, and sort of a bit wild and stuff. And I think there has been a bit of a rewilding of women who have sort of been give, given permission to just kind of go out there and do what they want more. Um, so I think there is a, a little bit of a feminist quality there as well. All right. So for for the for us men on the call, do you think they're going to um, do it? Do we need do we need races? Is that why is that why it was only thirty five percent men answered our survey last year? Is that is that what we need for next year to come back? I don't know. I, I've been in. I, I mean, I love racing, but I've really been enjoying the sort of the non racing bit of outdoor swimming this year. So, um, anyway, um, what the the I want to move on, so I'm going to quickly just share my screen again. Um, to show you the next thing we wanted to talk about was was winter swimming and um, because winter swimming so I was, I was joking recently has got so popular that even I'm doing it and um, and it's not something I've I've really um, participated in before and uh, this was a picture uh, near my house a couple of weeks ago um, Sunday morning really cold day um, and this this is just a small portion of the people who were getting into the river uh, in my house. Um, it was like this for for about two hours on us on a Sunday morning, and it's uh, it's been like that most Sunday mornings. So, um, just anecdotally, I've seen this sort of big you know increase in people. People never swam here um, before this winter, and I know that there's you know venues are closed, pools are closed, so so people are looking to swim anywhere they they like um anyway anywhere they can because they're so desperate to swim um but i also know that a lot of people that are, are swimming um have not swum in outside in winter before so just anecdotally i've i've seen that and then some of the numbers that came out of our our surveys back that up um what I found this one of the numbers that really jumped out at me when I was first looking at the data was we asked people who had just started outdoor swimming. So people who started in the summer. Um, and so we asked this in October, November. So before the winter had properly got going, but still it, it, things had already started cooling down. If after starting swimming in the summer, what their intentions were um, and three quarters of them, which I thought was huge, said their intention was to continue swimming through the winter. And that 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 really surprised me. But when I see the the numbers actually physically in the water, perhaps it's not so surprising. Um, and then we asked people, how often do they swim outside in winter? Um, and if, if you look at the, the, the three bars on the right hand end of that chart, that's um, 57% in total are swimming outside in winter at least once a week. Now this was um, obviously we're in another lockdown now and this was this was done uh, before uh, so October, November we were we, we weren't in lockdown then so obviously that that would have decreased now but it um, I think it shows that there's a there's a lot of demand for winter swimming that probably wasn't there before we I mean it's something we've, we've watched in at outdoor swimming we've seen it increasing sort of gradually but this year it's really it seems to as far as i can tell it's really really picked up um to to an extent that it seems that swimming isn't a summer sport outdoor swimming isn't a summer sport anymore it, it's definitely a around sport for a, a good portion of the people that are involved in it and so i'm really curious what other people think about that i mean jonathan we jonathan has been a winter swimmer, swimmer for at least 10 years um i mean have you the numbers you've seen in the places you swim have that does that sort of back up what you've seen anecdotally and what you've you know the correspondence you're having with readers and what people are talking about yeah totally i mean uh, yeah when i started 10 years ago it was essentially 
me and a few middle-aged women um, uh, tooting about Lido. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, and anecdotally, uh, if I look at Brockwell Lido, where I swim now, uh, so before lockdown, they were sold out. You know, you had to, 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 to log on like a week in advance to book a swim uh, to go swimming at Brockwell. Um, and yeah, and so Rowan on the, on the chat is saying that the same for her at Sir Cleve de Marine Lake, just staggering numbers uh, over this winter. Um, and it's continuing in, lo in lockdown. And hi, Chess. Uh, Chess is also saying an increase of over 450% on the season already. Uh, so it's, yeah, and Katia is the same. So uh, yeah, so from venues, we're seeing this incredible amount of growth. Uh, and as you say, um, there's, no, there's no longer uh, a May to, se to September open water season. It's now, you know, you have your summer season and you've got your winter season. So, so open water, it's, yeah, I guess it's a massive opportunity that, that, that people are now swimming all year round. And maybe it's slightly zeitgeisty at the moment. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we don't know whether this growth is going to continue the same rocket kind of fueled way. But um, I think if, if, you, if you're swimming in water that's two degrees, you don't do that lightly. So it's not something, it's not, it's not so faddy as, as other exercise things, I think. If you've got the, the, the determination to go and swim in two degree water, then chances are you're going to stick with it. Mm -hmm. Um, can we bring Carrie Ann back in again? Because you're doing your first year of winter swimming as as well, aren't you? Can you mm -hmm. tell us how that's going and what your uh, what that experience has been like for you as someone who's been swimming outdoors for years and years, and obviously a hugely accomplished outdoor swimmer, um, finding something completely new in in outdoor swimming. I must admit, I'm enjoying that training sessions very much in brackets now are about two and a half minutes, <laughs> maybe three, <laughs> and probably, which is about two hours less than what would normally have been my training session. So I'm really enjoying them. It's um, certainly a challenge. And, and actually, Jonathan has been my swimming buddy, which I've absolutely loved having all of his experience for coming and helping me kind of take, take it on. And um, I think a lot of what Ella was saying as well, and I think this is absolutely one of the reasons why it's winter swimming is now really growing is because of the community. Like I wouldn't, first of all, it's not safe for me to go and do it myself, especially swimming in the river, but I wouldn't do it on my own. It's not quite as fun as for me. There's not quite the buzz that I get going on my own. I would be too worried about that. Uh, so going with someone makes a massive difference. And I think that has been a huge, a huge part of it. Um, having spoken to a couple of people in the who are trying to do some research, so Dr. Heather Massey, a guy called uh, Mike Morris, I think his name is, from a company called Chill, they are trying to do a big research study on um, on open water swimming and its benefits for depression. Not open, sorry, cold water swimming and its benefits for depression, and they're hopefully going to be doing some sort of as close to a clinical trial as they can in 2022. Um, and at the moment, there is so much anecdotal evidence around, as I'm sure all of you guys know, around how it is really helping. Um, and what they can't figure out is if it's the community or if it's if it's just the cold water. Um, I think it's probably a combination of both. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to see how they deliver that and develop that over the next few um well the next year if you like in the next uh, bit of time after that but so for me from my perspective loving the journey of doing cold water swimming although it really you know you can't take it lightly I think um Jonathan and I went for a swoosh down the river which we were really excited to do a few it was New Year's Day I think it was actually um and I think I just spent a bit too long in the water and I uh, I got a little bit too cold and I couldn't feel on the top tips of my fingers for about three days which as a tutor of an open water qualification was just how could you be so stupid to carry on to do that um, and it did scare me a bit so I think that you know it really does you do really have to think about it um a lot more than uh than it's just going for a swim in the lake or going for a quick dip in the sea uh, actually, yeah. I, I, have we got um, Helen from RLSS on here somewhere? I don't know if she managed to join Hi, us. Hi Simon, yes I'm on. Hi. Helen, I know this is one thing we we spoke about um, when I, I talked to you about the... Um, so, so Helen um, works for RLSS and when we would... Um, when I was doing the research for, for the report, she was one of the people I spoke to and you, you raised the point that um, that you know, with more people swimming in outdoors in winter, that obviously raises challenges for you as an organization. 
Um, and, and you were talking about some of the interesting things that, that you'd been then talking to to venues about about uh, ensuring that their lifeguards stay acclimatized because it's one thing having the rescue skills, but if they're not acclimatized, they won't be able to get into the water to rescue people. Um, what you know in terms of what we're seeing, we've seen all this growth in winter swimming. What from the RLSS's point of view? what are you making of it and how are you responding to it? So we, we've kind of seen a major increase in people doing um, open water lifeguard qualifications for like the whole buddy system. So it's not necessarily for venues that want an increase in lifeguards. It's more so for the, for the wild swimming um, of buddying and looking after each other to know what to do in that instance, which is, is really interesting for us because when we talk to, you know, trainers who are putting these courses on, it's, it's not necessarily for that whole thing that we would see a lifeguard system, I suppose. Um, it's not as an employed role, it's just to help each other. So I suppose we're, we're really interested in that and we're, we're growing um, how we can support that moving forward. Um, but also, you know, with the cold water guidance, um, it's really important for us to think about the trainer assessors and how they deliver that for lifeguards because some venues this year have gone all the way through um, and hopefully we've been able to support them in some way to make sure that, you know, that's remained as safe as possible, but also safe for the lifeguards, which has been forgotten about in some instances, you know, where um, you're getting your swimmers in who are coming in every week, maybe once or twice, but the lifeguards haven't gone in for maybe 10 weeks because, because they, you know, don't like to swim in cold water but actually they're the response for the people if somebody is in difficulty so we're working on uh, developing a set of guidelines for trainers to be able to educate lifeguards um, moving forward in what to look for um, you know what to recognize in a better way for cold swimmers obviously they're all following a guidance of reducing course sizes reducing um reducing time in the water, making sure that people are consistent with coming into the water so they're not just stopping in September and joining in in December. So we're, you know, working on a set of guidelines in that instance. But yeah, it's been really interesting. It's been an interesting year that, that the lifeguard qualification has become more of a buddy support system rather than the, the thing that we've seen before where venues have wanted to put lifeguards on. Um, so we are working on that. and We've got, you know, a few ideas that we'd like to run by a few people. Um, and it may be that we work together, Simon, to, you know, put together another call in this kind of light to get everybody involved um, and pitch the ideas so that we can have a discussion around it to make yeah. sure it's right for the for the industry. Yeah, I'm sure people would welcome that. Um, Jonathan, has anything else come through on the chat yeah i mean just just some interesting stuff about um female participation so juliet from henley swim has said that 80 percent of people who signed up for their cold water challenge brass monkeys are women uh and then Kat is saying that um of 90 participants who went on a winter swimming course at queenford lakes uh only four were men so that's quite um yeah marked yes <laughs> okay um Right, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that we that it's already half past eleven, so I'm gonna move on uh, to the the last bit of topic that uh, that um, we wanted to talk about, and then we'll have a more sort of general discussion. Um, I just wanted to. This was just uh, almost an aside, but I was having a sort of nerdy dig around in the the data and making the correlations between people swimming in winter, wh whether they wear wetsuits and and gender and this this one really jumped out at me so this this is just an aside for a bit of fun but the more often people swim outside in winter the less likely they are to wear a wetsuit and that, it was a very sort of clear correlation there that if you swim you know one, once a week 66 percent of, of men and 53 percent of women say they wear a wetsuit but if they swim more than more than four times a week those percentages drop to 28 and 17 percent um I don't know what to, to, to make of that particularly, but I, it just jumped out at me when I was digging around in the data. So I thought I'd share that one. And um, so this was um, uh, one of the, the, the things that I was really interested to, to look at when we studied the data was what is the main reason? We asked people explicitly, what is the main reason you swim outside? Um, not in winter, just, just generally. Um, 
and um, we gave we gave these six choices. I'm I'm sure there are other reasons people from outside as well, but we in terms of being able to analyze the data, we wanted to give people sort of categories that they could choose from. Um, and um, the one that obviously really jumped out was much higher than all of the others was health and well-being. And that's for both men and women. You can see there are some differences between men and women, for example, in, in races, that's 10% men and 4% women. So there's some difference, you know, that's quite a, a marked difference there. And on the social side, 9% women and 4.3% men. Um, but health and well-being, so almost a third of men and women um, are saying that, that the reason they swim outside is for their health and well-being. We asked a similar question around um, mental health as well. You know, how important is swimming outside for your health and well-being and for your mental health? And the percentages came, came back really, really highly. Um, so, so there's obviously something, um, and I think, you know, Carrie Ann, you were talking about this just now, the, the cold water stuff, but I think it goes beyond just the cold water stuff. I think it's the whole thing about being outside in nature, exercising in green spaces. Um, but there's a really big health and well-being agenda and the, and the huge importance that people attach to health and well-being and linking it to their outdoor swimming. Um, so I'd, I'd be really quite curious to hear, um, you know, whether that's... Um, you know, is that something other people are, are seeing? In, is that, for example, maybe Ella, you can have a, you can talk a little bit to this from the people that are coming through on Dip Advisor. Is that, um, you know, is that a theme that you see there? And then maybe we can ask some of the people who are working at venues whether that's uh, something they see see at venues as well. Um, um I, well, I mean, listen, we've seen it in the news. It's all over the telly. It's on the radio. It's in the paper. You've been all over the news. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's usually me. Uh, swimming is great for your mental health. Have you heard? Um, yeah. I mean, I always say to people, ultimately, we know that physical activity uh, is a huge benefit for us, isn't it? Physically and mentally. And that doesn't mean if you suffer from depression you're going to be cured we all have um, a mental health often I think if you haven't um, ever experienced depression or any mental issues you think I, I don't have mental health but everyone has mental health um, our, our general sense of well-being is about being able to be resilient being able to cope all that kind of stuff so I think physical activity doesn't matter what you choose is going to make you feel better I think uh, if you take that activity outside, like you said, fresh air, natural daylight, uh, engaging with the natural environment, again, huge benefits. It reduces the cortisol levels in our bodies, you know, that fight or flight hormone. So I think lots of people talk about it because um, perhaps some people are returning to exercise um, after maybe not doing any kind of exercise. So they're sort of going back to swimming because it's easy to get back into. I mean, once you've learned to swim, um, it's something that's low impact. If you've suffered from injury, uh, if you're overweight, um, if you are looking for social interaction, it's quite an easy, accessible thing to get into. So I think that's why some people sort of return to the sport and then are like, wow, I feel amazing. Um, so I think there's lots of different factors there. Um, but yeah, we all feel great doing it. That's why we do it, right? Yes, well, I mean, it works for me. <laughs> um, have we got, uh, I'd like to, did I see Rick Kiddle somewhere on this Zoom? Did he manage to join us? Is Rick here? Or Yeah, hi, yeah. Hi, Rick. Um, you've been involved in running um, outdoor swimming venues for as well, years. I'm not, don't, don't, don't even say how many years you've been involved in venues of one sort or another. Um, do you think this is something that's that's changed over, you know, you've seen people coming through. I mean, I guess initially when you were running venues, it was a lot of triathletes you had who were, who were swimming because they had to for, um, for triathlon. Have you seen that sort of shift over the years that you've been involved in this? Yeah, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, obviously when I started over 25 years ago there was um, predominantly um, there seemed to be triathletes sort of doing emergency training for their triathlons um, but yeah the, the shift is enormous and um, the, the, the stats that we've been looking at have been incredible in, in terms of the growth and um, you know both 
male and female have, have grown enormously. And um, <clears throat> it, what, what's the interesting thing for us is that we're, we're wondering how many of those people are we going to keep if, if everything goes back to normal. So we've been working really hard on, on how to improve the customer journey and um, um, sort of retain the people that have left the, the sort of confines of the pools to, to come and swim in open water. So, um, yeah, I mean, the stats that I've seen pop up uh, are accurate. And, um, um, you know, we, we, it, you know, we're on a, a crest of a wave, if you like, and hopefully we can maintain and grow. And, and you know, it's going to give everybody in the industry more security in terms of longevity if it's commercial. Um, and I, so I think, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the underlying um, bonus for us all of, of um, you know, where we are at the moment. And the cold water stuff is, is phenomenal with, with our venues, uh, which Chess popped up in info was um, 450% up um, on, on swims overall. And then, then the winter, I think, 350% yeah. from last year, which was amazing as well. So, you know, it has grown um, exponentially. And that, and that health and that health and well-being as seems to be a big motivator for bringing people in. I mean, that's what people are telling us. Is that... What yeah, you know, I, yeah, obviously, I mean, yeah, it, it's definitely massive. And, um, but we also have the, um, uh, we, we do a, a, a lot of uh, surveys and a lot of people, because so, I didn't see it in your, your graphic there, is um, freedom, being, feeling in, in a, a sort of a free environment. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it Nate... It it's, came it's, up in, in the comments more than the, yeah... Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, generally, people, people, they're obviously doing it for health and well-being, but it, they want to do it because they can, you know, do health and well-being anywhere, you know, in any yeah. environment. It doesn't have to be I swimming. Think, so, I think also we need to remember that we've made uh, we've made swimming a lot more accessible. So ten years ago, when I was open water swimming, my, I was very limited by where I could do my swimming. There was a Lido uh, in central London. There was a lake near me, but I had to wear a wetsuit. I could only swim there May to September. Um, so now it's a lot more accessible. All the books and, and, and media coverage basically says you can pop to your local river as long as you've sort of done a bit of re research. So I think that's another factor. It's a lot more accessible than it's ever been. A bit yeah. like how yoga came to the masses. You know, once mm -hmm. yoga was just the, you know, someone, you know, on the top yeah. of the mountain, very zen. And now it's a hugely popular um, yeah. pastime. Yeah. Um, can I bring um, Gabby or Gabby Hay from Swim England or one of you? I don't know. Is it just you from Swim England? Or Hi. Yeah, there's a couple of us, but um, um, we can always bring them in. You know, in terms of what you've seen, what you know, what we've shown you about the, the, the growth in uh, outdoor swimming, the motivations for, for people doing it. Um, from a you know from the point of view of, of the NGB of swimming what what does that mean for for you and in terms of how you're responding to this and um yeah. you know what what are your plans to sort of yeah. serve the uh, yeah I, I think I think traditionally we as an NGB we've always been seen as maybe this we, we obviously look after pool swimmers a lot and and more the sport side of open water swimming so actually the competitive side but we've seen an, an, a ridiculous growth just in traffic to our website for the open water find a venue went up 200% you know, in the last year. And we've got a lot of content and experts within, within our organization that, that, that we can really help guide you know, new people to the sport or to the activity. We know that the health benefits are, are unbelievable and the value of swimming research we did last year just demonstrated that well-being element of outdoor swimming far exceeds indoor swimming um, so the, the area that we're really focusing on the moment is how can we as a credible pump some people might say an authoritative voice especially around pool swimming how can we capitalize on that for outdoor swimmers in terms of access so more access and the environmental messages and, and there's a lot of work that our public affairs team are doing at the moment in collaboration with other organisations to, to, to get on to the, uh, to, to 
contribute to the bills. So there's the end sewage uh, pollution bill that just went through that we contributed to, and we're just be going to become a lot more vocal on those issues, which will hopefully really help um, add weight and and get more people doing it. You know, we know that there's going to be more opportunities for funding to get more people into to outdoor swimming. Um, I think it's really exciting time. So we wanna work in partnership with as many organizations as possible to, to make sure that we can capitalize on it as a whole. So I'm definitely open to anyone got, that's got any ideas that wants to talk to us about you know, what we could do together, please do get in touch. So there's loads of exciting things. And, and I think what we wanna say is that we do want to support outdoor swimming as much as possible. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I'm, I, I'm going to um, take a, 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 another small digression. Um, in the report, uh, as part of the report, I spoke to Edda Cura from the, from the Black Swimming Association. I see we've got Omi Dale on the Zoom. I hope you don't mind me calling you out like this. Um, I hadn't planned to cover it today. And we, we didn't, when we did the survey, we didn't ask for ethnic information at all. So we don't know. Uh, from our survey, what what proportion of of black and ethnic minority swimmers responded to our survey? Um, we suspect it's probably a very small proportion, um, but um, be really interested to to hear from you whether you know this this sort of growth in outdoor swimming, this growth in um, winter swimming, whether um, black and ethnic minority communities. Uh, have are having the same have the same access to that as as the people we're seeing doing or what can people who are already involved in outdoor swimming do to make sure that you know venues are welcoming that swimming groups are welcoming to, to anybody that wants to come i wondered if you wanted to talk to talk about that at all yeah yeah sure um i guess a lot of what we're seeing with outdoor swimming at the minute in terms of representation in, with ethnic minorities is very anecdotal um, and it's definitely something both in the capacity of Black Swim Association in my personal capacity I've become more interested in but yeah I would say anecdotally um, it's even less representative than indoor swimming um, and this is definitely something we should be looking into but I think you know there are additional barriers that come with outdoor swimming that aren't necessarily present with indoor swimming in terms of knowing where to swim having open venues towards you know nearby um for example many people like in inner city areas simply we don't have any open outdoor clean water sources at the minute so I think there's definitely been a big divide during the pandemic itself um but yeah, knowing where they're safe to swim, knowing what kit you can you need to have, which is often much more expensive than those you would just need in a swimming pool, especially if you want a wetsuit, hats and gloves. Yeah, and I just think, yeah, the barriers that exist in pool swimming are heightened when you go to outdoor swimming. So, you know, and from my personal, you know, when I go swimming, I'm very often the only person of colour um, in outdoor swimming. So... Yeah, it's definitely something I think we have now got a renewed focus on as the pandemic has pushed so many people towards outdoor swimming. But yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry to call you out with that. Anyway. No worries. <laughs> That's OK. Um, Jonathan, what's coming through on the, the chat? Well, I mean, I guess just to, to circle back to, to mental health uh, and also I mean, <laughs> Amy and I are going to be um, uh, uh, just a bit of background. Only I are going to be a mental health swims hosts in uh, in South London, uh, so we're going to be working together on that. Um, but I guess that's that's also just part of this big movement, this big driver of people who want to look after their mental health, getting into swimming. Um, and so Chess says that that lots of people uh, are from different groups uh, with different kind of mental health problems have been going to to love open water, uh, and the same from Rowan, who coaches at Clevedon. Uh, lots of people. Uh, uh, coming to her because they they uh, want help with their, how they're feeling after the pandemic, um, and then moving on to um, uh, to um, kind of like to, to 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 keep people in the sport after the pandemic, which Rick was talking about. So Kerry Ann saying that um, uh, educating people that, that they can do their fitness swimming in the open water as well as in the pool, 
um, and, and kind of uh, making people realize that, you know, you haven't got to go pool, go pool swimming to keep fit. You can do the same fitness swimming uh, in the open water. And I guess just educating people about that. Okay. Um, yeah, we were hoping to have um, Rachel Ash from Mental Health Swims on the call. Um, she got invited at the last minute to go and talk to ITV. So she um, so she dropped us and, and went to ITV. But she did send me a, a message that she um, because I asked her the question, um, why do you think why do so many people no, hang on. Why do you think so many people say outdoor swimming is important to their mental health? I mean, that was one of the things that came out really strongly. Something like 70 percent of people say that swimming outdoors is good for their mental health. And she said it's it's all around connection, uh, connection to nature in the most immersive way, connection to your body, reminding your mind that it has a body and that your body is small compared to the world around it and connection to a community, uh, remembering you're not alone, even when feeling desperately lonely. Um, and then she also said it's it's uh, she pointed out that it's a, achievable even for those with not much physical fitness, which I think is something you were talking about earlier, uh, um, Ella. Um, and that it's uh, that it's very welcoming of different body shapes and body sizes. And then the last thing she said, um, which is almost a good place to end, I think, so it makes you feel like a badass who can do anything. <laughs> um that was that was really uh, you know those, there, there is a lot more in the report i'm going to just uh i'm just going to quickly share screens one more time um to sort of round up round up on the the, the sort of the formal bits that i wanted to go through um uh, this was just another slide on the on the general well-being how important is outdoor swimming for your general well-being what i thought was really interesting is is down here there's 2.5 percent of men and one percent of women say that outdoor swimming is not at all important for their general well-being that means nearly everybody that swims outdoors is feeling that there is some benefit to their general health and well-being so it's uh you know i think for me that's it, it's kind of reassuring that somehow what we do uh, all of us involved in outdoor swimming whether we're publishing a magazine whether we're organizing events whether we're running venues whether we're taking people on swimming holidays it's something that, that people really, really appreciate and really benefit from. Um, there's, as I said, there, there is lots more in the full report. Um, and if, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, have a, please do have a, have a read through. Um, I think um, if you, we, we've been sending out the, the summary version, but if you want a full version, if you get in touch with Yvonne, it, Yvonne, are you, are you still with us on the call? Maybe you can just sort of wave to let people know who you are. Yeah, I'm here. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we'll get you the full report. And I think, um, you know, if anybody wants to pick up any of the points or, you know, discuss some of the, the, the data we've uncovered in more detail, then get in touch and, um, and we can do that. Um, we're, we're also starting to think about, um, you know, what, what should we look at next year? I know it's it's uh it's quite a long way ahead and we don't know what's going to happen over the next few months but you know starting to think you know what sort of questions should we be asking swimmers that would be really useful uh, because we, we've seen that we can get a good response from from readers people like to share what they what they get out of swimming so i think we've got um uh you know we, we could almost do an, a, an annual attitudes to swimming survey but i think it could be a little bit different each year and we can ask people different questions and I think that's going to be really useful. And um, so, you know, it'd be really good before we before we start next year to, you know, to, to collect ideas from from people on who are here today. And um, so that was kind of everything I had on a sort of more formal basis. Does anyone want to sort of before we wrap up, throw anything else in that they, you know, questions they've had, things they think we might have missed or things they've seen in the report that we haven't talked about today? silence no, I, and I just wanted to reiterate I think it's it's been great to have a response to the collation of this report because what we're hearing is that it provides maybe some non-surprising -surpri results but it's actually putting it all in one place so it's all 
previously it was quite anecdotal, but now we're actually pulling the research. We've pulled together interviews and it's all in one place. So we hope that's really helpful for the, you know, this growth um, and opportunities. So please feel free to take any of the stats, any of the research, any of the reports, share it with all your communities. Let us know if there's aspects that you want more of it. Let us know if you have sort of um, members at the lake that you would like us to sort of join in a Zoom and share more information if it helps you. Uh, Rick, you talked about the strategy of growth and how you want to continue content. Clearly, we're a platform for loads of lovely content. And, you know, we're seeing people, you know, tapping into whether it's the dry land exercise is right now if they can't go to a venue or, or just getting inspiration so do feel free to use us and yeah we'd love any feedback like Simon says. Mark do you Simon, want to say anything I, from, I the, from, from your perspective in Montana? Yeah yeah absolutely can you hear me okay? Yeah yes good so I just wrote some notes and a couple of things um I've found two differences that there are people that like to train in the open water and then there's also people that just go for the dip. And so I think they're almost two different markets. Like for example, here in my lake, it just froze over as a matter of fact, like two nights ago, the wind chill right now outside is minus 35 where I live. And so you see the pictures of the people with the ax, you know, breaking the ice. They're clearly not gonna go for a long swim. They're gonna do more like Carrie Ann with, you know, dipping in for a couple of minutes. And so, so I think there's those people that are very mentally health oriented. And then there's a big component of people, obviously, that are training and going out for, you know, longer swims and training for something. So, so I see them as two different markets. But then also, I think a big thing for me is uh, addressing the minority issue. I also live on an Indian reservation and a lot of the tribal kids, they won't join a health club, you know. It could be an economic reason. It could be social reasons. But if I go down to my local swimming area to swim in the summertime, most of the population down there are uh, tribal kids. And so to, to convert some minority populations that maybe are economically disadvantaged to have open water swimming where they're not paying for a health club, they're not paying for a pool, it's a, it's a big opportunity for, uh, for families and people that, that just don't want to afford the expense of, you know, a monthly fee for health clubs and whatnot, and they can swim at any time, in any place, and most of the places, at least where I live, which is not much in terms of population, they can go anytime they want. So uh, just kind of, there's, there's a big cost advantage to open water swimming. Yeah. Um, anything else come through on the chat there, Jonathan? Um, yeah, just Chess is saying about, about um, <clears throat> improving accessibility and um, affordability. So um, whether that's wetsuits manufacturers making um, you know, more affordable wetsuits or wetsuits in uh, a greater range of sizes uh, and venues offering opportunities to, for education um, uh, to get and, you know, disadvantaged kids into the water. Um, so I guess uh, improving, um, yeah, especially for young people, she's saying. Um, yeah, so just improving access accessibility to, to different groups. If I could just say one last thing, um, again, from sort of from my perspective, I think the amazing thing about open water swimming is that there are so many different things that people can do with it, as you know, as Mark was just saying then, which kind of jogged my, my thinking. And I say this to the coaches that I coach all the time is that, people are not always going to just do one thing there'll be maybe an event that they take on there's a 5k event coming up 10k channel swim and then they might take a bit of a break from doing full-on proper training but they'll still miss the communities they'll still want to be part of the the group of people then there's people you know taking on um the henley swims brass monkeys challenge and that's something that's all we've not really got anything else to do right now so let's take that on that sounds like a really good challenge it's again it's very much community based so I think the amazing thing about open water swimming and how far it's growing and how fast it's growing is I think because there are so many different events. It's a bit like the events in a swimming pool, the 50 freestyle all the way up to the 
1500 and everything in between open water swimming is almost starting to become its own version of that as well now and i think that that's why there's been such a, a massive increase a steady increase sorry throughout it until obviously this year or last year when the pandemic hit and pools were closed and this was one of the only sports in the uk that was allowed to be done i think that's really spiked it but i do think there has always been a, a upwards trajectory of open water swimming anyway because of all the different opportunities that there are out there so yeah sorry it's just a, it was a really interesting thing that a lot of people come to me going well i was doing that and now i'm doing this so i think we'll be able to keep people within the sport for a lot longer because there are so many different opportunities for yeah. events challenges all that kind of stuff but a lot of it's community-based yeah no i really uh you know I really hope people will stay and, uh, you know, and not just for, for our sake as a publisher, but, uh, you know, I know that um, the event companies had a really difficult year last year. I know the swim holiday companies had a really difficult year. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, the people that started swimming last year will start looking for, you know, what are we going to do with this new thing we found? Are we going to go on holiday? Are we going to do events? Are we going to do challenges? Um, and, you know, they can explore all the all the brilliant things that that people have created around outdoor swimming so i'm i'm quite excited for this year actually um so hopefully we can you know vaccination roll out soon we can get back in the water and spring will be here and hopefully it will all be it will all be lovely that's what i'm hoping for anyway um you know and uh, I, I it's really great that so many of you could join us today as well to talk about the um the report and yeah please uh you know please get in touch if, if we haven't covered any everything that you wanted to hear today yes. simon i think um if it's hello can you hear hello? me yes who sorry i can't see who that is oh. i can hear a voice john cr oh hi john <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hi there. um very, very very interesting conversation with everyone and i i don't know if everyone realizes but i'm involved in the international winter swimming association we organize the um, events uh, throughout the world and every two years we have our uh, uh, world championship which uh, would have been um, uh, last year um, sorry it was last year and we've got one next year but I just think all I wanted to say is that uh, that in in Europe the idea of the connectivity between nature the connectivity between the um, local um, uh, sort of individuals meeting together in often in pretty ghastly or very very cold circumstances so that connection is absolutely critical and is very very well founded so the fact that in the UK we are in a way catching up is is wonderful because it's the, the barriers to entry are as you say one hopes we can keep them low but more importantly the correlation between well-being and also the idea of you know you feel very vital at the end of a swim and you've enjoyed your swim but more importantly you know it's a, a fantastic for um, mental health and i think my friends in estonia and lithuania and and uh, uh and even in siberia as well would all agree that it's that's you know a very very important factor so uh and i hope that as a consequence of this ghastly pandemic that we've gone through that we can retain people that can be welcomed to carry on this extraordinary extraordinary pastime of just being in water and being with people mm. uh, and I think that's uh, you know all to be um, you know, very much I like you Simon I very much look forward to it yeah thank you very much okay um, I think we're, we're about we've, we've, we've gone on for an hour I think that's uh, what we were intending so I think we're going to unless anyone has any final comment I think we're going to close it there um, you know where we are if you've got more questions all right Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's lovely to Thank see you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Have a good day, everyone. Take care. Nice to meet.